He holds a PhD in English Literature and a second master's degree in Information Science and a professional project management certification. He is currently working on a master uh, in online teaching uh, certification. Uh, he tells his nieces and nephews that he is in the 36th grade. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Tobin has dedicated his career to serving students whom higher education might otherwise serve poorly or not at all. Uh, those such as learners with uh, work and family responsibilities, active duty military students, learners, uh, learners with disabilities, and others from traditionally underserved populations. He brings to us this fight for your rights approach to the study of copyright and fair use in higher education. Dr. Tobin is talking to us today about copyright for faculty members in 90 minutes flat. So welcome, Dr. Thomas Tobin. Thank you very much, Veronica, and I'd like to thank the uh, University of South Carolina Aiken for asking me to come and be the keynote speaker for the conference this year for National Distance Learning Week. I'm honored to be here and working with all of you folks out there. I'd like to start off by doing a little bit of housekeeping, but of course before then, one quick requisite disclaimer. So here is the requisite disclaimer. The information contained herein along with any questions and answers is provided for educational purposes only. Neither is a substitute for legal advice and neither is to be construed as the rendering of legal opinion. The presenter is not a lawyer nor does he even play one on TV. The ideas and materials herein are based on more than 20 years of practice as an educator, faculty developer, and all-around copyright nerd. Rest assured that actual lawyers who specialize in copyright and intellectual property have looked over this content and given it their general blessing. Seek immediate medical attention if you experience copyright knowledge lasting more than four hours. So now that we've got the disclaimer out of the way, I'd like to see if you would join me in a little thought exercise. For those of you who are participating live, uh, if you're in a room with others, you might want to grab a piece of paper because I'd like to go way down the rabbit hole, so to speak, into a very specific case about copyright and intellectual property. Who owns the monkey selfie? Picture yourself in Indonesia. You're a famous wildlife photographer, and you've been tracking a group of macaque monkeys for days. And finally, they've gotten used to you being there. Your camera equipment, you, the jungle, the monkeys, everything is just sort of blending together. The monkeys are accepting you as just part of the background. And you're able to take some beautiful photographs of the monkeys. You spend a great morning taking photographs of them, interacting with each other. Uh, you're starting to understand their social hierarchies. You're starting to really get into the photography and research that you're doing. And then you decide that you want to take a break to have some lunch. This actually happened to the photographer in Indonesia. The photographer left his camera equipment right where he was photographing things, and he retreated some distance in order to have a little lunch and then come back and photograph the monkeys some more in the afternoon. While the photographer was away, a few of the monkeys from the troop got curious about his photographic equipment. They opened up his bags, they pulled out lenses and looked at them, and one of the monkeys picked up his camera. And in examining what the camera was, accidentally clicked the shutter button. Well, the camera went click, 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 and the monkey said, hey, when I press this button, it makes a sound. And so the monkey started pressing the button and took a whole bunch of photographs of other monkeys, of the floor of the jungle, uh, up in the trees. Of course, the monkey didn't know it was a camera. The monkey just knew, press this button, make a sound. And the monkey got curious. A little while later, the monkey turned the camera around so that the lens was facing herself. And the monkey kept touching the button because it made the sound. The monkey was curious about it. And out of the 980 photographs that the monkey took, this one that you see on your screen is one that the photographer, when he came back and saw that the monkeys were playing with the camera, this is the one that the photographer said, I've never gotten a photograph like this. You can even see the camera lens in the monkey's eyes and you can barely make out the monkey's own hands pressing the shutter 
reflected in the monkey's eyes. And you see the curiosity in the monkey's face. So the photographer thought, this is fantastic. I'll crop this photograph. I'll put it out there on my Flickr stream. And uh, of course, everything I do, I place a copyright symbol out there for people to know this is my work. Well, some nature aficionados saw the photograph and agreed it was quite beautiful and quite striking. And they copied it and they posted it on Wikipedia on a page about black crested macaques. And so the photographer found out about this and said, well, that's mine. Please take down that photograph. Sent a request over to Wikipedia. Well, the folks at Wikipedia, here's where the challenge comes in, said, no, we're not going to take down the monkey selfie because you can't claim copyright in it because you, photographer, didn't take the photograph. The monkey did. And the person who takes a photograph can claim copyright to it. And since the monkey is not a person, no one can claim copyright to this photograph. Now this went all the way through the courts, and since it happened uh, in Southeast Asia, it, Indonesian courts got involved, and uh, United States courts got involved because Wikipedia's servers were in the United States, and Wikipedia won this one. There isn't anybody who can claim copyright to that monkey selfie photograph. So as you're thinking about how you work with copyright in your own institution, at your own campus, whether you're a faculty developer, a faculty member, an administrator, a multimedia person, this is a real thorny issue because who actually owns what we do? Who actually owns the content that we use and share and work with every day. So what does the monkey selfie have to do with copyright for faculty members? Actually, I have to confess, just about nothing. This is how most presentations on copyright probably start. You have somebody who's a legal expert talking to you about a very specific case and you start despairing and you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to sit here for 90 minutes and listen to all these different cases and I hope maybe something is going to apply to me. So I want to make you all a promise about the time that we're going to spend together today. I'm not going to go into specific cases. I'm not going to try to turn you all into junior lawyers in terms of copyright. What I want to do with you is I want to provide a four-item rubric that you can use in your institutions and in your own work as a faculty member or with faculty members so that you can stay on the right side of copyright law 90% of the time. There will always be cases where we need to consult our institutional lawyers, our legal professionals. I want to also give you some hope to determine whether copyright even applies to what you're doing and our session today knowing the difference. And I also want to share some alternative ways of getting access to copyrighted content, even if you can't do it under the usual laws and the usual legal restrictions that apply to them. I also want you to leave here with a robust way of defending how you use your materials, either in your online courses or as technological supports for your face-to-face -face or blended learning. So those are the outcomes that I'd like to work toward with you folks, and I want to make this as well an interactive session. Toward that end, let's test out some of the, uh, the interaction here, and let's start by talking about who's here today. Before we start moving into uh, content that's owned by other people, I'd like you to just take a look at the, uh, the chat session down in the bottom left-hand side of most people's screens and just key in where you're from. Just say hello from University of West Georgia, University of Chicago, University of San Francisco. Where are, Where is everybody from this morning? And I see Christy from Atlanta Technical College. Good morning. Fantastic. USC Aiken from our hosts. University of South Carolina Beaufort. Robeson Community College. Good to meet you folks this morning. And some more folks from USC Aiken. Fantastic. Georgia Regents. USC Columbia. 
And if you have a bunch of people in the room, uh, just uh, wave your hand or hit a bunch of exclamation marks in that chat box, and that'll be shorthand for there's a bunch of us here and we all say hello. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for testing out the, the chat feature with me. wanted to make sure that those of you who are here on the, the live session have access to that keyboard, and you'll be using it as we go along. So stick around close to that keyboard if you can during our time together. If you do have multiple people in the room with you, that's awesome. And please elect somebody to drive, elect somebody to be at the keyboard. We're going to do a lot of interaction, question asking, polling, and those kinds of things to make sure that we're customizing some of this presentation just for you. So let's talk a little bit about how we deal with content that's owned by other people. In the teaching that happens at our institutions and in the research and publication and those kinds of things that we do, we rely on the work of other people. We have to. And it's a, a situation where, flip forward here, I want to get a little sense of the knowledge in the room. So uh, I'm looking forward to the new Star Wars movie that's coming out in almost just a little over a month. And so my quizzes are titled uh, in an odd little way here. Quiz number one is A New Hope. And I'd like to share the first question with everybody. Let me open that up. And in the Adobe Connect area, you should see question number one here. And let me just open the polling. And this time I want to share all of the results with everybody. So which of the following choices is an example of copying? This is going to be a, a central concern for us. So I want to just get a baseline about what's going on here. And uh, Professor Outlaw, if you want to move your mouse away from there. There we go. And we'll let everybody bring in their votes. Awesome. So is it linking to a file on YouTube? Is it sharing the web address of a file on YouTube? How about providing keywords for finding that video on YouTube or saving that video file from YouTube onto your own computer? Got about half of everybody who's uh, in the participant list participating here in this poll. Take a couple seconds and click your response. And you can see the responses of everybody else. So, so far, we're running uh, about 7 to 1 on saving a video file from YouTube versus linking to a file on YouTube. So keep those votes coming in. We'll keep the polls open for just a little while longer here. All right, we're going to close the polls now. It looks like the voting is in. And... So it looks like linking to the file on YouTube got a vote, and saving a video file from YouTube onto your own computer got the majority of the votes. So good going on this one. We're not going to show you the answers until we go through the, the whole quiz here. So let me just pull this one down. There's a second question. Which of the following items are not protected by copyright? So is that works that are created by the federal government? Is that works that have the copyright symbol displayed on them? How about things that are published on the internet? Or how about student written papers in your class? For this one, I'm also going to share everybody's votes so you can see how people are voting. Yeah, move my, get my mouse off of the poll there for you. All right. Now here it looks like the voting is running in a couple different directions. And we have some folks talking about works for, get created by the federal government. Other folks are voting for student written papers in your class. Hmm, interesting trends on the, on the polling here. And we'll give it just a few more seconds to get anybody, anybody in here who hasn't voted yet.
And I see a couple people trying to vote over in the chat feature. Just click the radio button in the poll, and that'll actually lock in your vote. All right, well, it looks like everybody has uh, closed in on this poll. And works created by the federal government receiving a few votes, and student written papers in your class also receiving a few votes. So I'm going to close this part of the poll. And one more question for you. Which of these works is protected by copyright? Let me open this one up. So is it your spouse's unpublished journal? How about a movie from 1929 where copyright hasn't been renewed? Or the latest budget office report from Congress? Or how about software code where the creator gives up all of the rights to the work? Let's see. Hmm. Looks like we've got some votes coming in and there's a little disagreement on this one, too. Let's see who's voting how. We've got some movies from 1929 where the copyright hasn't been renewed. Some people voting for the spouse's unpublished personal journal. We've got a lot of brain power on the seminar, so this ought to be an interesting vote. And we'll leave this poll open for another maybe 15, 20 seconds. Let folks vote. I see a couple people changing their minds. All right, going once, going twice. Let's close these polls out and let's take a look at what the answers actually are. So which of the following ones was copying? So that was saving a video file from YouTube onto your own computer. If you remember in the poll, and I'll just reopen that poll there, we had some votes for linking to a file on YouTube. Well, in that case, you might not have actually made a copy. So you're just linking out to it. You're pointing people to where that video on YouTube is publicly accessible. And most folks did choose the right answer on this one, saving a video file from YouTube onto your own computer. So good job with that. Second one, which items are not protected by copyright? And this is one of the things I want you to walk away with today, and we'll get into this in just a couple of seconds. But this one, there was some concern. Works created by the U.S. government. Some people said student-written papers in your class. Actually, all the other ones, except the works that are created by the federal government, all the other ones are covered by copyright. So works that display that, we know that. That's copyrighted material. Works that are published on the internet, anything that is born or created, the expression of it is automatically covered by copyright. So folks didn't vote for those things, good that you did not. Student written papers in your class, you don't have to actually register anything with the copyright office in order for copyright to actually apply to things. So student written papers in your class, those are covered by copyright, and we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. The only ones that aren't are works that are created by the federal government. This is why Ken Burns has a job. He is able to take still photographs from the Civil War or uh, photographs from the Works Projects Administration uh, that were created by federal government employees, and he can use those photographs without asking for permission, without uh, having to work on copyright issues at all because Things that are created by the federal government are expressly put out there without copyright attached. That's called being in the public domain. Something that's in the public domain, you don't have to worry about copyright at all. And so we'll talk more about that. So good job on this quiz as well. And the third one, which of these was uh, covered by copyright? And in that case, we had some neck-and-neck -neck voting between your spouse's unpublished personal journal and that movie from 1929 where the copyright hasn't been renewed. Well, the only one on this list that's published, or excuse me, protected by copyright is that your spouse's unpublished personal journal. Even if something is never shared with anyone else, the fact that it is an expression of an idea means that you own copyright to it. 
And the minute you put pen to paper, the minute you type those words into the Microsoft Word document, the minute that you record the video or take the notes or speak into the microphone, what you have created in that fixed format, you have copyright control over that. By the way, why is the movie from 1929 whose copyright hasn't been renewed, why is that not protected by copyright? Because copyright has expired, and I want to tell you a story now that will help you to understand about why copyright expires in the first place. So good job with the quiz, everybody, and let's keep rolling through here. First of all, what is a copy? These are some photographs of a bee on a flower that I took at the Garfield Park Conservatory here in Chicago a couple of years ago. And I have to tell you a story about when I was 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, you have to picture me as a kid with long hair down to my back, a heavy metal t-shirt, ripped jeans, scuffed boots, and a horrible attitude in class. I was always getting sent to the principal's office. I was always in trouble. You can probably tell that something changed between then and now. At the same time, I was always getting punished. And one of the biggest punishments that I ever got was the, the teacher would tell me, you're being punished. Go to the principal's office and help them make copies. Well, I would go to the principal's office, and to make copies, they would put me into a very small room with a copy machine. I would have to load paper into a feeder. The copy machine was essentially a giant round drum where you would load the original onto a plate, and then you had to hand crank this giant drum, and paper would go around the drum, and it would come out the other side. And it was a hard work. This was actually a punishment. Cranking the drum, cranking the drum, and out the other side would come these sheets. And the sheets wouldn't be like the thing that came out of the printer, which was the original. That was on white paper. It was crisp and clear. The ink was black, and it was easy to read. And the stuff that came out the other side, those sheets of paper were a little damp. The ink was blue, and it was kind of fuzzy. It was harder to read, and it smelled to high heaven. I probably lost more brain cells doing the mimeograph machine than I did in any other thing in my misspent youth. So if any of you folks remember the mimeograph machine, uh, just put an exclamation mark into that chat window if anybody remembers what those mimeograph machines were like. Yep, a couple of people remember those things. So if I'm evoking the mimeograph machine, why am I doing that? Well, when I was 12, it was really easy to tell what was the original and what was a copy. So, you know, the original was crisp, clear, easy to read, didn't stink. The copies, they had a particular chemical smell to them. They were a little damp. They had that blue, fuzzy, outline-y quality to the text and to any images that got created. So it was... A, difficult to make copies. I often had to switch arms to get through a big load of copying. And it was also easy to tell what was an original and what was a copy. Now, fast forward to today. What you see on the screen, these pictures of the bee. Which one is the original and which ones are the copies? A very different question, isn't it? As in a matter of fact, none of these are the original. The original one was on a memory stick inside my camera. So all of these are copies. So today, it's vanishingly easy to make exact ones and zeros computer copies of multimedia, Microsoft Word documents. You name it, we can make a copy of it. And it's as easy as pressing a button or selecting something and saying copy and then paste it somewhere else. Now, copyright law hasn't really caught up with that ease of making copies, although we have, in recent years, had some updates to copyright law. So let me tell you another story. It's about priests and professors. Go back to 1788, when the original copyright laws in the United States were being drafted. Thomas Jefferson had a huge hand in making those copyright laws, along with several other noted thinkers. So as that committee was putting together the original copyright law, 
they wanted to create a protection for things that weren't tangible goods. So if you were a merchant and you were importing finished woolen goods and cotton goods from the United Kingdom, and you were importing tea and hammers and biscuits, your trade was protected under trademark, patent, and various other kinds of laws that existed in the United Kingdom for a long time. And in the new United States, those laws were largely copied over from the laws in Britain. But Thomas Jefferson and his colleagues, they wanted to find a better way to protect intellectual property, the expression of intellectual rights. And so they came up with the idea of copyright. What that meant was, if you had an idea and you put that idea into a fixed format, back in the day that fixed format was likely going to be a book or a newspaper article, you had the right for other people not to simply copy that information without at least seeking your permission. This was useful for trade and the economy, and it was also useful for higher education. Thomas Jefferson was the person who put in the first exception to copyright, and he called it fair use. Now, I talk about priests and professors because the only people who could engage in fair use back in 1788 were members of the clergy, and teachers in higher education. So if I am a priest and I want to take an article that appeared in a newspaper, it was written by my friend Benjamin Franklin, and I wanted to copy that and give a copy to each one of the people in my congregation and preach about the idea of thrift and value from the pulpit, no problem. I didn't have to ask Ben Franklin's permission. I had full the full run of that article to be able to do whatever I wanted under that clergy and higher education exception of fair use. The same thing if I was a professor at Harvard. And in those days, Harvard was one building in the middle of a swamp with cows grazing on the lawn. If I wanted to teach my divinity students and there was a book that had been published, well, I could ask the university proctors to copy that book and give it to my students without having to buy the book from the person who wrote it. That was an exception for higher education. And uh, that didn't actually go away until the 1880s. So priests and professors, that was the original fair use. So fast forward to today. 1976, the laws on copyright, they've changed over the centuries. But in 1976, we got laws that actually said what is and isn't copyrighted. And they were put down in a much more strategic and much more detailed way. So let's talk for a minute about what is and isn't copyrighted. During the quiz, all of you folks did an admirable job of identifying things that are and are not copyrighted. So things that aren't copyrighted, works that are created by the federal government. We talked about those. The term of copyright, Back in Thomas Jefferson's day, if you wrote that article or wrote that book, you held copyright over it. You could say who could use it and who couldn't, with the exception of priests and professors, for 35 years after it was created. That was it. Then fast forward a couple of centuries, and copyright was 50 years after you died. So if you created something, you held copyright through your natural life, and then for 50 years after you passed away. Recently, the Walt Disney Company saw that the copyright on the character of Mickey Mouse was going to go out of copyright. It was going to go into what we call the public domain, where anyone may use it for any purpose without having to ask for permission. And they sponsored some uh, lobbying efforts, and Congress extended in the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act the term of copyright to be now 70 years after the life of the creator or the person who created it. So if that copyright doesn't get renewed, it's the rule of thumb is 70 years after the creator's life. And this uh, actually saved us from having a whole bunch of legal knockoffs of our friends Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. Also, what works are not copyrighted if the owner actually gives up some rights to the work. Linus Torvald, a computer genius and a coder, 
he wrote the operating system for computers called Linux. It's a, comp it's a competitor to the Apple system and the uh, PC Windows system, and it's used by a lot of uh, administrators, and it's a, an elegant machine-level code. But when Linus Torvald created the Linux operating system, he went and met with a lawyer and created a license that said, I give up all my rights to this work. I want to make this what we now call open source. So anybody can write more code based on this. You can modify the code, you can take some out, you can put new things in, you can develop it and, and make it live and breathe. And that's exactly what happened. Over the past 20-something years, Linux has been turned into a commercial version. There's still a free version of it, and people keep tinkering with it and, and improving it. So by giving up some of those rights, or all of those rights, uh, Linus Torvald actually started a movement, and he's considered one of the founders of that coding area today. So now that we see what is and isn't copyrighted, we can go to what works are copyrighted. By the way, this is probably as close as I can come to showing you a certain mouse uh, who, whom, uh, who was created by a person named Walt. This is actually an image from NASA of craters on the moon, and since NASA is a federal agency, this image is in the public domain. But what things are copyrighted? You folks who are taking the quiz were right. Anything that is created and put into a fixed format, including the material you, that you create for classes, including the content that your students create. Every time a student creates a three-page essay, that three-page essay, the student holds the copyright to that essay. So let's say, as a faculty member, you wanted to use that essay as a good example for future classes. You would have to get permission from the student in order to do that. And it's helpful to hold those permission forms or emails or letters so that you can show that you have that permission to do so. You don't have to put the copyright symbol, the C with the circle around it, and you don't have to register something with the Copyright Office in order for copyright to apply. If it's made, you have copyright over it. And this has implications for lots of stuff that we find out on the internet that are being shared freely. The people who created those things still hold the copyright to them, whether they're enforcing it or not. So, now that we see what is and isn't copyrighted, let's talk a little bit about priests and professors and that fair use exemption to copyright law. Before we do that, and you see what you have on the, on the screen here, there's a whole bunch of legal ease from the 1970s on the screen. Come over to your, your chat area, and if you have heard of the term fair use, key that into the chat. If you have a definition of fair use, or if you have a rule of thumb that you've heard of, what does fair use entail? What can you use as a faculty member or a person who supports them? What can you use that was created by other people? Do you have any rules of thumb, any ideas about how you, uh, how you go about using things fairly under copyright law? I see one participant saying, I've heard of fair use. Awesome. Uh, fair use, 10% of videos or music. Let's see, particularly for education purposes in your class, so it's got to be for an educational purpose. Somebody else saying, I've heard of fair use, about 10%, which is still vague depending on the publication. Yep. Somebody else saying, I've heard of fair use. I've understood a percentage of material for use in education. So I see a lot of people talking about that 10% rule. Hmm. Well, allow me to share one thing that's going to make things more complicated, and then we will immediately uncomplicate them. When I ask this question, no matter who the 10 people are whom I'm asking at 10 different institutions, I get 10 different answers. And this is one of the challenges about copyright, is we don't have clear rules of thumb that we can follow in order to be able to stay on the right side of the law most of the time. And a couple of people have referred to that 10% rule. The 10% rule isn't actually in the law anywhere. Where that is, it's in a case finding from a, a, a Texas Circuit Court judge back in the 1980s who was hearing a case about fair use, 
And as he and his staff did the research, they couldn't find any particular threshold or any particular number in the law in terms of what's the percentage. So the Texas judge said, well, the person in this case used about 10%, and that seems to be a pretty fair sample, so about 10%. And that opinion got published, and it became part of our collective consciousness. Please forget the 10% rule, and I'll tell you why. The two quotations that you see on the screen in front of you Tell us why, if you ask any 10 people, they'll give you 10 different answers, and why, if you ask a lawyer, the lawyer will immediately say, it depends. So here's where we get things a little complicated, and then I'm going to immediately uncomplicate them for all of you. The first quotation is from a law textbook on intellectual property, and the 1976 revision of the Copyright Act changed the original nature and function of fair use. It's now a defense rather than an affirmative right of use. So think about the priests and professors story with Thomas Jefferson. In that scenario, the priests and professors had a right to use that newspaper article from Ben Franklin, that book that the Harvard professor wanted to copy. They had the right to do that and not have to ask anybody for any permission or bother with the rest of copyright law. That was true up until 1976. And in 1976, the whole flavor of fair use changed. It became now a legal defense, which is why the lawyers always say it depends. Instead of the question being, may I use this or may I not use this? A yes or no, a binary, a flip the switch up or down sort of question. The question now becomes, how strong is my case for using the copy of this material? And you see that most of us, when we're thinking about fair use, we're thinking up and down. We're thinking yes and no. Can I use it? Can I not use it? Where in the law, you're actually building up a case out of constituent parts. And that's a little tiny ray of hope that I want to latch onto and get to with all of you. Here is the last piece of despair, though. Before we get to hope, we have to go through despair. This is from the House of Representatives report in 1976, talking about their understanding of the new copyright law as it was in 1976. Here's a quotation. Although the courts have ruled on the fair use doctrine over and over, no definition has ever emerged. Since this is an equitable rule of reason, no definition is possible. Each case must be decided on its own facts. What this means is that the people who made the law can't define fair use. So how do we define fair use? Okay, there. Now we've hit rock bottom. We, we don't have a definition for fair use. We don't have a way that we can figure out how we can say, oh, there's no 10% rule, and we're making a legal defense. Okay, Professor Tobin, you've got us over a barrel, right? And along with everybody else. So let's start with a little bit of hope here. If you take away nothing else from our time today, take away these four things. Now, in the copyright law, they're in a different order, and they might be called different things, but I have simplified them. This is something that you can share with your faculty colleagues, your faculty developers, multimedia people, your IT folks. This set of criteria will keep you on the right side of copyright law 90% of the time. So think about the four words that you see in bold, purpose, amount, nature of the work, and economic impact. These four terms, if you apply this mnemonic or memory aid, P-A-N-E, pain, like a pane of glass, like a clear pane of glass, like I am clear about copyright use. So each of these is not a yes-no question. But imagine that it's like a slider that goes from really strong case for using it to really poor case for copying it. So let's talk about the first one. 
purpose. So for purpose, this is right from the law. Are we engaged in criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research? For those of us in higher education, this one is almost a slam dunk. If we are making a copy for teaching purposes, we have a strong case under the purpose criterion. If we're making a copy for our own personal scholarship or research, if we're doing criticism or commenting on it, one of the things that I didn't quote in here is if we're making it for parody, making fun of something, that's a protected purpose under fair use. So almost all the time when we're making copies for our classroom use or for technological support of the classroom or for online courses, we have a strong case under purpose. When might we not have a strong case under purpose? If the copying that we're doing is merely decorative or it's meant to advertise something. Those are not protected purposes under fair use. But if we can say, yes, this is for a teaching purpose or a scholarly purpose or research, yeah, strong case for fair use. Slide that slider all the way over to strong case. Then we consider the amount that we're using. And this is where everybody says 10%, 10%, 10%. Do you know what the law actually says? It says a representative sample meaning use as much as you need, but not more than that, and be able to say why you're using that much. So if you're using less of a whole item, and this is where I think somebody in the chat said, you know, 10%, which is still vague depending on the publication. This is where people get into scratching their heads because, okay, I have a book, and it was written by one author, and can I use 10% of the book? If that's 300 pages, may I copy 30 pages out of the book? I have another book. It's written by many authors, a chapter book. And so is the 10% 10% of the total page count, or is it 10% of just the one chapter, or what? And then I want to use a poem, and what's 10% of a poem? And am I counting words? Am I counting lines? Throw all that thinking to the side. Under amount, you make a stronger case when you are using the least amount of the work that makes your point, that helps you do what you want to do. And if you can explain why you are using that much of the work and no more, you have a strong case under amount. So for some folks, you might be able to make a strong case for using half of something if it is essential to your scholarly purpose. For most folks, use a token amount use a quotation of a few sentences, a few paragraphs, a few pages. If you're looking at a chapter book and you want to use an entire chapter, common sense and reason will tell you, yeah, that's probably a whole thing in my eyes, in my students' eyes, in the author's eyes, so I want to use a representative amount of that chapter. So using that representative amount, we can move this slider over to making a strong case if we're using less and we can make a case for we're using no more than we need. So purpose and amount, we're pretty good at that. Nature of the work, this is the one that not a lot of people know about yet, but it's actually really easy to apply. So in terms of nature of the work, the main criterion is whether the copy that you're making is of something that's more factual or more creative. Remember, you can hold a copyright on the expression of an idea, but not the idea itself. So the expression of the idea is putting it into a physical format, making the video, making the audio podcast, writing things down in a document, putting them out there in some fixed way, writing in your journal. Remember your spouse's personal journal, that had copyright attached to it. So if you wanted to make a copy of a report from, say, the Pew Research Center, about the state of our college learners and how many of them own mobile phones. That's mostly factual. That's research-based. And so you would have a stronger case for making a copy of some of that than if you wanted to make a copy of some poetry or of some pages from a novel, things that are more creative endeavors. Now, this is not to say that you may never copy creative works just that you have to have a stronger case in the other areas if one of your cases is in the middle of that slider or on the weaker side of the slider. The other thing that goes under nature of the work, if you're only going to give it to your students or use the copy one time, 
that's a stronger case than using it over and over and over again. So copying that item, we used to put them in our prof packs. We'd have the photocopies and we'd bind them up. Or we might make a copy of a, a PDF from uh, one of our library databases and then take that PDF and put it into our learning management system courses. If you're only doing that once, you have a stronger case for making that copy. But if you want that to be a reading for your students every single time you teach the course, you make a, a weaker case on that one. Nature of the work is probably the slider where you could be on the strong side or close to the weak side in any given use of copies. And economic impact, the last one. This one is the no-brainer for most of us. Are we making the copy so that our students don't have to buy the thing it's in? So for example, you use a particular piece of software like Maple or SPSS in your mathematics and statistics class. You have a licensed copy of it, and you don't want your students to have to buy it, so you get some CDs, and you burn the software on the CDs, and you charge your students $2 a piece just to cover the cost of the CDs. You have definitely broken copyright, and that's not fair use, because you're depriving the people who created the stuff of the ability to, to make some money or have an economic gain from that. Same thing if you are copying an entire thing as a reading and giving it to your students every single semester so that your students don't have to buy that particular textbook. Now, the rise of open educational resources, that's fantastic because those folks have given up some of their rights. And we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. But before we do, each of these, purpose, amount, nature of the work, economic impact, each of these is a slider. And I've got a question, what about universities that are for profit? Awesome question. And fair use applies to for-profit institutions. At the same time, I'm going to have a couple of asterisks as we go along for people in the for-profit arena. So good question. You're anticipating where we are going here. And in terms of for-profit and not-for-profit, fair use is almost the same. And so let's actually do a little little quizzing and a little thinking about fair use generally, and then we'll get into some of those differences. So good question to ask at exactly this moment. So quiz number two, just staying with our Star Wars theme, the quiz strikes back. One of those elements of the PAIN acronym, purpose, amount, nature of the work, and economic impact is nature of the work. So what would be the best example of appropriate use under nature of the work? And let me open up a poll for you folks here. Is it amount, assigned value, ethical value? Whoop, that's not it. I apologize. Let me back this up. Question four. There we go. Let's try that again. Now this time I'm not going to broadcast the results, so your vote counts and you won't see other people's votes until we're done. So is it copying that economic report into your prof pack every semester for students to read? Making a PDF of an economic report and you give it to your class one time to make a point? PDFing a poem and you distribute that to your class every semester? Or making the PDF of that poem so the students don't have to buy the entire book in which that poem appears. I see folks voting now. Good show. Looks like we have about half of our participants voting so far, so we'll leave this open for a couple more seconds. see a couple people changing their mind here at the last second, so we'll give you 10-15 more seconds here. All right, let me show the results now. Looks like most of you chose the second item here, PDFing that economic report to distribute to your class once, and there are some votes for copying the economic report for A and a vote for D as well, so let's close that one down real quick and go to one more question. 
Which part of the PAIN acronym deals with whether you would be depriving somebody of revenue or profits? And again, I'm not going to share the results, so you're going to be voting by secret ballot this time. And I see that our host, we can see her mouse, so we know how she voted. <laughs> If you want to vote with your host, it might be a good idea. And I see about half of our participants have voted, so we'll leave the polls open for a couple more seconds here. So is this amount, assigned value, ethical value, or economic impact? What part of PANE deals with this one? And let me broadcast these results. It looks like everybody voting for D for economic impact. So we've got some consensus. And here are the answers. So let's take a look at that first question that we asked in this part of the quiz. So under nature of the work, it was make a PDF of that economic report because it's more factual than creative. So the first criterion was, is it more factual or more creative? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't copy the poem. It just means that we have a stronger case for fair use for the economic report. So if we do copy the poem, we do have to make a stronger case on the other elements of pain, on the purpose, the amount, and the economic impact. Also, if you're putting it in your prof pack every semester, is it one-time use or is it repeated use? One-time use is a stronger case. So most of you who are voting for that B there, PDFing the economic report to distribute to your class once, you got both of the criteria under nature of the use. Factual versus creative, one-time use versus repeated use, and that one on the, the last one, PDF the poem to avoid students having to buy the entire book, that actually goes to economic impact. So that was kind of a, a wild card in there. Good job with that part of the quiz. And the answer on number five, you all got that one right, so let's show everyone getting that right. And you notice everybody who voted said economic impact. Good deal there. I'm just checking to make sure that the terms that we're using are sticking in your brain, so fantastic. And there is an economic report to the president done by a federal agency, so that one is actually an exception. And that's what I want to talk about now. So let me close down this poll and talk about things where we don't have to worry about the copyright law itself or fair use. So let me say one thing. Now that you know the purpose, amount, nature of the work, and economic impact criteria, those apply only when Full copyright is in force. And the next thing I want you to take back to your campuses is this phrase, licenses and permission trump the law. So if you have a license to use something in a broader way than copyright or fair use exceptions would allow you to do, you may do so according to that license. Remember Linus Torvald meeting with the lawyer and saying, I've written this computer code. I'd like it to be free for everyone. He and the lawyer had to spend approximately a week putting together a license that laid out Linus actually giving up all those rights. Every time you install software on your computer, you get the little box that comes up. It says end user license agreement. And that's the stuff that you scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll all the way down to the bottom that no one ever reads. And then you say, I agree to these terms. They could be you know, asking you to sign over your firstborn child and your kidneys and your car keys. You would never read it. At the same time, those end user license agreements, those are dense legal ease things that lawyers love to put together. And they're this impenetrable thicket of information and words. What you see on your screen is something called Creative Commons. Larry Lessig at Harvard University a few years ago said, I'm a lawyer and I don't like those end user license agreements. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a plain English way for folks to share their work in a way that went beyond what copyright and fair use allow, 
that was backed up by those great big giant legal agreements, but was just in plain English so people could understand the rights that they were holding on to or giving up. And he came up with the idea of Creative Commons. And this is actually where we go back to for-profit universities and how copyright and fair use has an impact for them. Because in a for-profit institution, the materials that you use that other people have created, because you are technically selling the work that you're doing, you have to get permission or purchase a license for permission to use those materials. Now, fair use does apply when you're using short excerpts from things, but if you're using longer bits, it's always in your best interest to get permission for a license. Now, the other way around that, for those of you in the for-profit arena and those of us in nonprofit uh, places as well, is to look for things where people have already given us a license or permission to use their stuff beyond what copyright and fair use allow us to do. So in terms of Creative Commons, there's four different types of permission, of license, that people can give. Attribution. You may use my work. You may make a copy of it. But when you show that copy, you have to say that I created it. Non-commercial. You may make a copy of my work, but if you are in a for-profit institution, you may not use it as a copy. So if you see that non-commercial license, then you would pass it on by and look for another resource. No derivative works. You may make a copy of what I do, but you may not change it. You can't take my color photograph and turn it black and white. You can't take my video and only show the first half of it. You can't take my picture that I took and crop out pieces of it. You have to use it exactly as I created it, please. And share alike. That if you do use my work, you have to allow other people to use your work under the same licensing terms that I did. So if mine says, please attribute it to me, yours should also say, please attribute it to me, the creator. If mine says no derivative works, your sharing of it should also say, don't make any derivative works, and so on and so forth. So these four Creative Commons license categories are backed up by giant legal agreements. So what we can do is we can go to our favorite search engines, like Google, like Bing, like Flickr, like Vimeo, like YouTube, and find the advanced search or more search tools element in each of those places. There is in each of them a way for you to filter your results so that you're looking at only Creative Commons licensed works. And with those, fair use doesn't apply because you already have the limitations of the licenses. And remember, licenses and permission trump the law. So if you have permission to use something outside of fair use or in a more involved way or use the whole thing, that trumps fair use, and you should hang on to that permission that you get. Creative Commons, if you're using something under a Creative Commons license, you should make that attribution. I apologize, I actually want to flip back up here. If you fair use secrets of the P-A-N-E, picture of a lovely weathered old set of windows on an old abandoned house. And look in the bottom right-hand corner. There's some tiny type down there. Image copyright 2011 Robert Fenner used under Creative Commons by license from Flickr.com. I gave him the attribution that he wanted. So I'm following that license, and so I didn't have to apply purpose, amount, nature of the work, and economic impact to whether I used this image in this presentation or not. So that's Creative Commons. Let's take one more quiz. There's going to be four of them here. So here's a question that I mentioned in passing earlier in our conversation. What is meant by a work in the public domain? This is the have you been paying attention question, but we're also going to zero in on something real useful here. Let me put that poll here, and I'll open this one up. And again, this one's going to be by secret ballot. Was it never covered by copyright protection in the first place? Has the original owner passed away? Is it more than 70 years after the author's life? 
for it was created in a country with no copyright law. Looks like about half of our folks have voted, so let's leave the polling open for a couple more seconds. And by the way, for uh, our colleague who asked about for-profit institutions, I hope I've addressed that. We'll be talking about that as we go along for the next couple of minutes, too. All right, let me broadcast this one out. It looks like we've got a bunch of votes in, and everybody voting for B on this one. Boy, I hope you guys are right. Awesome. So we'll close that one out. And one more question here. So what is... Creative Commons. Just talked about it. So do a little double checking here. And this poll is going to be open under secret ballot as well. So is this a clearinghouse for copyright of musical works? How about US laws for using copyright materials? Informal set of guidelines for how to use copyrighted works? Or is it license agreements for common sense use of copyrighted works? I see some votes coming in. Ooh, I see people changing their votes and changing them again. And changing them again. Think back. You just learned this one. And everybody voted really quickly on this one and then changed and changed and changed and people are changing again. Awesome. So we see a lot of folks saying license agreements and uh, some folks chose informal set of guidelines, C, and then changed their mind. Some folks said B and then changed their mind. So there's some, there's some challenges here and some changes. So let's take a look at the answers on these two. What's meant by a work in the public domain? I think everybody got this one right, so awesome job. And that is, it's been more than 70 years after the author's lifetime, and the copyright has not been renewed. So. What does this mean in terms of what we can use in the public domain? If it's in the public domain, the copyright no longer applies, it's no longer enforceable, and it's expired is the, the technical term of art, which means that something in the public domain can be copied, all of it. You don't have to go through purpose, amount, nature of the work, or economic impact. So what does that mean for us? It means that William Faulkner's works, Ernest Hemingway's works, are just now coming into the public domain. So we actually have to go back quite a ways to find things that have uh, expired and the people who created them, you know, where, where they're gone and nobody has renewed the copyright. There's a question, who can renew the copyright on old things? I'm going to hire our, our colleague Lori to come with me on these presentations and ask these questions at exactly the right time. And who can renew the copyright? Well, if you are the heir or the corporate rights holder, then you can renew a copyright. So for example, uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, his executors are led by uh, Marielle Hemingway, the actress, and she was able to renew the copyright on her father's books. Now, this is not a never-ending cycle. You can go through that renewal process only a certain number of times. It's usually just once um, for corporate things. That's why they, uh, the Walt Disney Company asked to have and lobbied to have copyright extended from 50 years after death to 70 years after death because uh, Walt Disney held the personal copyright on Mickey Mouse. Walt Disney was the person who actually drew the character of Mickey Mouse. So in a way that... Uh, Elsa and Anna from Frozen were created by teams of animators and are corporately owned by the Walt Disney Company. Mickey Mouse was a personally owned copyright from Walt Disney, so it was only Walt and his heirs who could have renewed it and not the company. So good question to ask and awesome work on this question. Everybody, you folks rocked that question. And the answer on the, se the number seven here, what is Creative Commons? I saw a few people changing their minds, and it was good that you did because you got the right answer. That is, the set of license agreements that allow for common sense use of copyrighted works. Why wasn't it a set of U.S. laws? Because Creative Commons is a licensing agreement. It was Larry Lessig at Harvard and his colleagues who did that. And so it's not actually in the law. It goes beyond what the law allows us to do. And it, uh, those licenses allow us to give up some of the rights that the law gives us in order to share things more freely. 
And why isn't it an informal set of guidelines for using copyrighted works? Because it is very formal. These are legal agreements. And so, remember P-A-N-E, purpose, amount, nature of the work, economic impact, and remember licenses and permission trump the law. And let me talk a little bit about permission real quick here. This is a model permission letter from Columbia University. You can go to copyright.columbia.edu and you can use this and fill in the blanks and change it around how you want. You can always ask for more rights than you have. When I taught courses for a for-profit institution over the past 12 years and I wanted to create course materials, I would always ask for permission because I knew I didn't automatically have it under the law. And I would say, may I make a copy of this video that you created or this article that you published? I'm teaching in a for-profit institution. I'll give you uh, attribution and credit for it, and I'd like to drive people to your research, and would it be okay if they also contacted you as well? And when people said yes, I would save the email where they said yes, or I would save the document that they had signed and said yes, go ahead and do it the way that you're requesting it, and that permission goes beyond the law. So when in doubt, ask. Nine times out of ten, people are usually happy to share their ideas and their work with you. You can specify how you'll use the work, even if you're in a for-profit institution, based on those P-A-N-E criteria. If you say, my purpose is a scholarly one, um, I want to use the whole thing, the nature of your, of your work, you know, this is creative stuff, or you, you've come up with a new idea in the field, and I want to share that with people. And economic impact, you know, I want to make sure that I'm actually driving people to your website or to the journal and perhaps asking them to purchase your work or get more involved in it. You know, set it up how you want. But getting permission trumps the law. So as a real quick review, the P-A-N-E criteria, purpose, amount, nature of the work, economic impact. And then licenses and permission trump the law. So that's the short version of what we've talked about today. So here's one last quiz question, and this is to take everything we've learned and put it all together. So in these situations, in which of these situations does the principle of fair use best apply? And this one, you can help each other out. We're going to do this open so you can see who's voting. Copying an excerpt of a product review from a magazine as part of the brochure for your startup company. Copying a popular song to use as the background music for one of your course presentations. Copying a paragraph from a book on the Civil War for a history course handout or creating a link to an existing YouTube video to support a point in your online lecture notes. This one's curious because there's a little bit of fair use, there's a little bit of permission, there's a little bit of licensing in each of these, isn't there? There's a little bit of public domain in some of it. Think this one through. I see people voting, some people are changing their minds. This one deserves a little brain power. Looks like we have two-thirds of our potential votes in, and it's neck and neck. Oh, it's 50-50. we got 10 votes in. Copying a paragraph from the book. Creating a link to an existing YouTube video. Anybody want to vote for any of, like, A or B? They look lonely. Uh, looks like people are changing their minds. By the way, I may be completely misleading you on that. All right, it looks like people are coming 50 here. Let's actually close this poll. And this was a one-question quiz. One-question quiz. So what's the answer here? The answer is copying that paragraph from the book on the Civil War for your history course handout. Let's actually look at the other three and why they're not good examples of applying fair use. First, copying the excerpt of a product review from a magazine as part of the brochure for your startup company. Come over to your keyboard and just key in your thoughts on why that product review from the magazine for your startup company, uh, why that might not be under fair use. 
see a few people type it in. Awesome. Take a couple seconds and say why you learned why A isn't the answer. Let's see. It's used for your personal profit and gains. Yeah, economic impact. That's a huge fail. Somebody else says your company receives an economic impact. Exactly right. Um, it's promotional material for that company, so you can't use it because you didn't pay for it. That's exactly right. If you did pay for it, if you got permission or you paid for it and said, I, I want to put this in my promotional brochure, may I have permission? That would trump the law, and then you could use that. Awesome. And somebody says, that's plagiarism. Well, it might be or it might not be. Um, plagiarism comes in when you're claiming that something you have copied is your own. Now, if I copy that, that item, that excerpt of a product review, and I say, this is where this is from, and I give it a citation, it wouldn't be plagiarism. At the same time, I would be violating copyright. Yep, and somebody else says, you're going to gain financially. That's exactly right. Okay, second one. Copying a popular song for the background music for one of your course presentations. How come that one's not right? How come that one's not fair use? You folks are getting this. This is awesome. I see a few people typing in. I'm going to take a sip of water while you do. You don't own the royalties. Actually, in music, royalties, that's for commercial purposes. So let's say that it's for your course. Let's see, nature of the work is created. The slider would be way over. That's true. But that's not where I'm going. And let's see, unless you've secured permission, you're taking it. There it is. Thank you, Leela Rogers. Unless you've secured permission, you're taking away potential revenue from the artist. Somebody else says potential revenue is hindered. That's exactly right. If you're copying that popular song and it's just background music for the course presentation, you fail A on economic impact. That's a really low slider on that one. But you also fail on purpose. Remember, purpose has to be for scholarship, criticism, news reporting, teaching. If it's just background music, does it serve a direct teaching purpose? No, not really. It's just kind of decorative. Now, if the popular song, you were examining the lyrics of the song in terms of your course, that's a teaching purpose. Be very careful about whether you have a strong or a weak case in terms of purpose. We think that one's the automatic slam dunk for all of us in higher education. It's not always. So this is a little bit of a trick question to get you thinking about, well, if I'm creating a flyer for an event that's happening on campus and I put a picture in there just as a decoration to sort of show what the event is going to be like and somebody else owns that, that's decoration. That's not for a scholarly purpose. So be careful about those kinds of things. Again, it doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means you've made a, a poorer case on, per, on the purpose criterion. Awesome. And we know what the right answer is. So what about D, creating a link to an existing YouTube video to support a point in your online lecture notes? And some of you voted for this as a, a good example of fair use. Instead of going to the chat on this one, let me show you one last thing. You all know purpose, amount, nature of the use, and economic impact. You all now know licenses and permission trump the law, but please forget everything you just learned. There's only one question that you need to ask first. Did you make a copy? Remember we started our conversation by talking about what's a copy. We talked about the mimeograph machine, how those blue pa pages were kind of damp and they stank to high heaven. Those were copies. We talked about making copies in terms of digital copies, making real easy copies, just copy and paste, digital ones and zeros. So did you make a copy? Out there on the internet, there are billions of resources available that are freely and publicly available. One does not need to have a username or a password or, or something like that to, to get to them. 
And there's a question coming in here as well. Are you in violation if you share something that is in violation without your knowledge? And we'll talk about that ethical obligation in just a second. Because if you answer this question, no. If you didn't make a copy, then copyright does not apply. Period. If what you are doing is just pointing other people to a place where they can go see the same thing, and you didn't make a ones and zeros copy and put that copy somewhere that you own, if you're just pointing people to the YouTube link or the web address for something, then copyright does not apply. You can use the whole thing. You can use it over and over again. You can point people to it all the time. You can have them read the whole book if the book is shared publicly. And so this may change in the following decades. But according to copyright law right now, these two things that you see on your screen are not copying. Hyperlinking. If you know the public URL, web address, for a resource, and you give that web address in your text, then all you're doing is pointing to it. You have not actually made a copy. Streaming via embedding and share codes. How many of you have gone to a web page and there's a little picture that uh, indicates there's going to be a video and there's a little play triangle with a circle around it and you just click that? Did that person actually make a copy of the video and host that video in their learning management system or on their web server? No. All they've made a copy of is the player. And you've already got a license to do that from YouTube. And most learning management systems have a means of doing an embed so that the video file stays on a web server in Washington, D.C., or San Francisco, or Toronto, Canada. And it is pulled down onto someone's device at the moment they want to do it. And I see another question. What if the book you want to share is not legally shared? A similar question about are you in violation if you share something that's in violation without your knowledge. We're going to talk about ethics in a second here, but I want to stay on the law real quick. The other thing, remember licenses and permission trump the law? Uh, this dog has librarian glasses on. I can make this joke because I am myself a librarian. And uh, this dog actually sort of resembles me if you think about the mustache and the hair and the coloring. So, But check with your librarians to see if you already have licensed copies of material that you want. Does your library subscribe to that journal? Does your library have a subscription to a video service. So for example, lots of movies and documentaries, my library already subscribes. So I can tell my students, go to this place and log in with your username and password, and that username and password will give you access to the thing under the license that my library has already paid for. So if you're not making a copy, copyright does not apply. Let me talk a little bit, uh, before we get into the ethics questions, about some tools in the learning management systems at most of your institutions. Whether you're using Desire to Learn, Blackboard, Moodle, Sakai, goodness, there's a billion of them out there. Hyperlinking. This is from Desire to Learn, the system that we use in our, uh, our institution. But it's true in Blackboard, Moodle, Sakai, all the other ones. And Canvas. If you say to your system, here is the web address, and you see in my URL it says this is not a copy.com slash hosted elsewhere.jpg for JPEG, and the title hyperlinks are not copies. If you put a clickable link to something, you did not make a copy, you may use it pretty freely, and the risk that we run there is, well, maybe the URL changes or the link goes down or something like that. But we are also no longer bound by a license or permission or copyright or anything. We're just linking to something. So that's the best way to get around copyright that I know of. And we'll talk in a second about the ethics of doing that, too. Embedding. Same thing in my learning management system. There's usually an enter embed code, that second red arrow. And that's not copying either because if you go to YouTube, there's a little share link and you can get the embed code. It's a piece of computer code that puts the player into your web page and calls the video down at the point of need when people want to watch it. So those temporary copies that go into people's working memory on their computers and then that information is just forgotten later on, the law doesn't consider that copying. It's kind of cool. 
now is a good time to talk about the ethics. Just because we can legally hyperlink to resources or use the embed code for video and audio and other multimedia resources doesn't mean that we lose our ethical obligations to make sure that the people who are sharing the resources are sharing them in an ethical way. So if I wanted to show a scene from the film Goodfellas from 1990 with uh, Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro and a host of other characters, Ray Liotta and all those sort of old wise guy mob movie actors, I could go to uh, Newgate, or excuse me, New Lion Cinema and go to their website and find clips from the production company and give them credit. That would be the ethical thing to do. I could also go out onto YouTube and find a whole bunch of short clips from Goodfellas that were uploaded by fans. They were watching on their DVD player or their Blu-ray player and they ripped some video up and put it up there and said, I'm a fan and this is my favorite scene in the movie. And so that the person who made the copy probably doesn't have permission, probably is violating copyright. So when we look at things that are shared by other people who didn't create the content themselves, then we do have an ethical as good researchers and scholars to give attribution and to make our best good faith effort to make sure that we're sharing things that are themselves shared in an ethical fashion. So I'd like to talk about some takeaways for you. In England, these Chinese takeout containers would be called takeaway containers. So I always put that image up there. But what are the things that you are going to bring back to your institutions? Come on over into the chat window and share a couple of sentences with how, what you'll be able to apply tomorrow or share with others at your institution. What are you taking away from our time together? Give everybody a couple of minutes to come in here. While you're typing, I want to say thank you very much for being an engaged audience. This was an awesome session, and I, it was mostly because you folks stepped up, asked questions, took part in the polling, all those kinds of things. And I know that I'm looking forward to the rest of this National Distance Learning Week conference as well. There are going to be a lot more good presentations here, and I hope that it's useful learning for all of you folks. I see folks typing in pain seems to avoid a lot of fuzzy questions it absolutely does that's why i chose the acronym it's not the uh, it's, it's not listed that way in the law that it's in a, diff in a different order and i actually reordered the items so that it spelled out p-a-n-e like a pane of glass like i'm clear about fair use somebody else talking about pain getting permission for students for sample papers that's key um, your students hold copyright. Your own lecture notes, you hold the copyright to those things. So if somebody else wanted to use those, you would say, well, you need to ask my permission for that. And uh, also, I see this presentation will help me in my service in our distance education committee as we interact with faculty teaching online. That's fantastic. Please go back to your institutions and have these same kinds of conversations. I share my materials under Creative Commons licenses, so please take from me adopt, adjust, and the only thing I'll ask is make sure you say, hey, Tom told me this, and send me an email message later on and tell me how you're implementing things. Other people talking about Creative Commons. The uh, Copyright for Faculty Handout, Dispelling the 10% Rule, Information about Creative Commons, and uh, a question. If the entire movie's on YouTube, can you copy some of the movie to show it as a clip in a scholarly presentation? Two comments on that. One, if the entire movie is on YouTube, it probably wasn't put there by the production company. So if it's not an ethically sourced movie and you're taking a little piece of it, uh, that's, a, that's an ethical problem and not a legal one. Uh, a lawyer is probably not going to come after you. At the same time, shy away from doing that. Um, make your copies from a legally sourced copy. So actually go and buy a copy of the DVD or the Blu-ray and then rip your your small segment yourself and share only as much as you need. Uh, let's see, pain and 10% makes sense. Please forget 10%. Awesome. And uh, is content created for the LMS co-owned by faculty in the university? That's actually the other 90 minutes of this presentation. I talk about what, who owns what, 
when we create content, there's three models. I'll say real quickly, three models are the faculty member owns the whole thing. That's fairly rare. There's work for hire in which the university or institution owns everything. And that's usually spelled out in the employment contract your institution. At for-profit institutions, this is the norm. What I make for my college or university, the college or university owns, and they can then allow other people to teach from it without my permission. The most common model is a shared right of ownership, where faculty members grant the university the right to use materials that the faculty member puts into a fixed format, like lecture notes or videos or those kinds of things. But the university also agrees to allow the faculty member the right of first refusal. You know, you're the first person who we will always offer to teach this particular course because you made the materials for it. So talk with your university council about which of those three agreement types obtains on your campus. And if it, you don't have a separate agreement, that's a really good conversation to start on your campus. Also, I see, uh, is it fair to assume that free apps are using images and content that's original and being shared? No, not necessarily, but most folks are following good copyright law in the commercial space. And I want to I want to say, don't extrapolate what we talked about here out beyond higher education because we've got purpose nailed down most of the time for research scholarship, criticism, and, and teaching purposes. But when we get out into commercial uses, like that one question talked about, you know, if you want to take an excerpt from an article and put it into the promotional brochure for your business, we're in a whole different part of copyright. So please keep the narrow focus that we had today. And one last question here. When faculty members develop online courses, what are those IP rules, intellectual property rules? If the faculty member was paid a stipend to develop the course, the rules are, and this is the, the second part of your question, is the answer. The rules are specific for each institution. Those have to be employment-related contracts because copyright law actually says if you work for an organization, then the work that you do on work time using the work resources like computers and resources like people, all of that is owned by the institution. I worked for Blue Cross and Blue Shield here in the United States for seven years. Absolutely everything I created for them in their learning and development arm is owned by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I do not own the copyright in any of it. Now, in higher education, there is a long-standing tradition of ignoring work for hire, of saying, okay, faculty member, you made a new chemical process, you created a new educational theory, you created a publication, those things, you may claim copyright to them. But that is just that, a tradition in higher education. So this is one of those opportunities. I want to circle back around to what we were talking about earlier. Here are some further resources. I'm going to flick these on the screen and then get rid of them because you can download these resources from the file share box in the lower right hand corner of our session and you can always come back here and get them. I'll say thank you to everybody for a wonderful session with everybody. And I will say one of the things that I said at the beginning, these rules of thumb, the P-A-N-E acronym, the licenses and permission trump the law, the did you make a copy, those three pieces will keep you on the good side of copyright 90% of the time. And, you know, the other 10%, some of the questions we're seeing here, like who owns what and all that, that's a good opportunity to get your university council engaged and involved. I'm actually going to flip over to one other item here. And that's the one-page copyright flowchart. This actually walks you or anybody else through the decisions we all just made. Did you make a copy? Well, uh, have we got permission? Do the pain criteria apply? Do we know who created it? Can we get to who created it and figure out? And if yes, can we ask for permission? So this takes anybody through exactly what we just did in 90 minutes in about six minutes. So please take that copyright handout. And you see Dr. Outlaw has put in the uh, link to the survey. And I appreciate your feedback on this. We're coming up at the, the end of our time here, but we still have about five or ten more minutes before the session ends. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Outlaw with thanks and with uh, encouragement to everybody to enjoy the rest of this USC Aiken 
National Distance Learning Week virtual conference. Thank you so much for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Colvin. That um, session was uh, as excellent as the one that you did when I saw it uh, at Distance Learning Administration. Um, it looks like you got a lot of feedback about how helpful this was. Um, and again, I encourage everyone to fill out the survey for this session. Uh, we do have about 10 more minutes before the session um, officially ends. Uh, so if you want to address any more questions for Dr. Tobin, we have a few minutes to do so. And Dr. Tobin, thank you, thank you so much for opening this conference. Absolutely, glad to do it. While you're filling out that survey, if you do have any other questions, I'll stick on the line for the next 10 minutes or so. I see a few people typing in some thanks, so thank you very much. and glad to have you folks as part of the presentation. And just a quick question here from uh, participant June Carter. In August, similar questions about ownership of property when receiving a stipend was asked. My takeaway is that one should inquire at the university about work for hire. That's part of it. Yes, that's correct. Um, the who owns what question, because it is based on tradition in higher education and not on the law as it's written, that's why it's unclear to a lot of folks. And some people think, oh, yeah, because I got paid for it, then the university owns it. But that's not automatically the case. And it's very, very useful for, especially if you're working in a, a unionized environment, but especially for your faculty senate, no matter where you are, to have that conversation with the administration about who owns the materials, because that is best done under a contractual agreement best done under an actual agreement that goes beyond what the law says because the law can be interpreted in many different ways there so for example at my own institution we put together an agreement that said under certain circumstances a faculty member could create materials for a class and this is face to face online you name it as long as it was in a fixed format a faculty member could create those materials and own those materials outright and the university had no share or say in it there were also situations where the university would own those materials outright. For example, if the university wanted to create a new program and hired outside consultants or our own faculty members to create materials so that others may teach from them, and that was the stated purpose for it. In that case, the university actually signed a separate contract with those people for that particular work and treated it like work for hire. And then everything else was what's called joint right of ownership. So the faculty member would grant the university the right to use the materials, and the university would grant the faculty member the right to take the materials elsewhere if they worked somewhere else or uh, had another use for them in a different context. So that is definitely a question 
to talk to your university council, talk to your faculty senate folks, talk to your administrators, and double check and see if you have some agreements there. Licenses and permission trump the law, and agreements are especially needed when you're talking about work that you yourself are creating at work for your institution. And another comment on this one, I'm thinking about when an instructor left mid-semester and tried to take all the course materials with him. Typically, joint grant of ownership, that would be an okay thing to do, not in terms of leaving in the middle of the semester, but at least in terms of who has the rights to those materials. Fantastic. Well, I see that uh, it looks like the questions are tailing off, and we've shared the web link to the survey. If you haven't taken the survey, please do take a couple of minutes for this one and for all of the sessions that you're going to see throughout this conference. And uh, that's going to help to determine and make better the sessions for next year's conference. So we're definitely looking forward to the rest of this one and looking forward to next year. Thank you again, everybody. I'm going to sign out now. And uh, thank you again to the University of South Carolina Aiken for hosting. Thank you, Dr. Tolan, once again. And the last note that I want to leave is that um, all of the sessions will be recorded, and the archives and handouts will be uh, provided later. And that email will come from me uh, probably next week with the updates to the uh, uh, web pages, which will include the link to the archive, the video and the handout archive. Thank you so much.